Well, welcome everyone. We're going to start in just a minute. Well, welcome. Welcome to the Maplewood Memorial Library Foundation series E Pluribus Unum and tonight's event, Working Toward a More Equitable Maplewood, Our Library as a Bridge. I'm Sarah Lester, the proud director of the Maplewood Memorial Library. Last September, we had the privilege of welcoming home Alberto Ibarguin, Columbia High School graduate and president of the Knight Foundation. In January, we were honored to welcome John Palfrey, president of the MacArthur Foundation. And tonight we are thrilled to welcome Mark Morial, president and CEO of the National Urban League in conversation with Rebecca Blumenstein. This is a hometown event as both Mark Morial and Rebecca Blumenstein live in our community. Both of our distinguished panelists have participated in the Maplewood Ideas Festival. And I just found this poster from 2015 when Mark oh. was one of our esteemed presenters. I thought I would share that. Um, and six years ago, you were talking about the 20th century lessons for 21st century America. Yeah. Uh, so this is an exciting time as we plan for our 21st century library in Maplewood. We will break ground on an inspiring, sustainable and technologically advanced building in late fall. And tonight, Mr. Morial will help us explore what role the library can play in helping to reduce barriers to social, economic justice, and economic justice in our community. Mark Morial has been described as one of the few national leaders to possess street smarts and boardroom savvy. He is the current president and CEO of the National Urban League, the nation's largest historic civil rights and urban advocacy organization. He served as the highly successful and popular mayor of New Orleans, as well as the president of the United States Conference of Mayors. He previously was a Louisiana state senator and was a lawyer in New Orleans with an active high profile practice. He is a leading voice on the national stage in the battle for jobs, education, housing, and voting rights equity. A graduate of Georgetown University Law Center and the University of Pennsylvania, he has been recognized as one of the 100 most influential Black Americans by Ebony Magazine and one of the top 50 nonprofit leaders by Nonprofit Times, one of the, one of the, hundred, one of the 100 most influential Black lawyers in America, and he has been inducted into the International Civil Rights Walk of Fame in Atlanta, Georgia. Rebecca Blumenstein was named deputy editor in the publisher's office in February 2021. In her role, she works closely with the New York Times publisher, A.G. Solzberger, to support rapidly growing journalism operations. Ms. Blumenstein served as deputy managing editor of the New York Times since February 2017. She led an expansion and elevation of the business report and ensured the Times remained an essential destination for live coverage and breaking news. Prior to joining the Times, she was the deputy editor in chief of the Wall Street Journal. Before that, she was page one editor appointed in September 2011 and a deputy managing editor and international editor since December 2009. Ms. Blumenstein has also served as managing editor of the Wall Street Journal online and as the China bureau chief overseeing China coverage for the journal. Yeah. Ms. Blumenstein holds a bachelor's degree in economics and social science from the University of Michigan, where she was editor in chief of the Michigan Daily. A native of Essexville, Michigan, Ms. Bluenstein is a longtime resident of Maplewood, New Jersey, where she lives with her husband, Alan Paul, magazine writer and author of Big in China, One Way Out, The Inside History of the Allman Brothers, and Texas Flood, The Inside Story of Stevie Ray Vaughan. This is going to be a fantastic evening. And please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and we'll field questions after the discussion. It is a true honor to welcome Mark Morial and Rebecca Blumenstein. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for that most generous introduction. And Mark, it's great to have you here tonight. Thank you, thanks Rebecca. So I, I want to start off at the beginning, and I'd like everyone to think of plenty of questions because Mark and I want to leave a lot of time for that uh, in the second half of the program. 
But Mark, you are nationally recognized, uh, famous in many ways. You were the youngest person ever elected mayor of New Orleans. Just wondering what brought you to Maplewood South Orange <laughs> and your family? What's the what, what was the connection from New Orleans? Yeah, Orleans so here? thank you. Thanks for the question. Thanks. Uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll tell the story. So I, uh, 2002, I finished my second term as mayor of New Orleans. New Orleans chief executive, the mayor is term limited to two terms. Uh, and as a lawyer, I he did, I guess, the, 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 the usual thing and joined Louisiana's largest law firm. Uh, and I was minding my own business in my office after being there about five or six months. And I got a call from a friend who uh, was close to the chairman of the board of the National Urban League who said, they're doing a search for the next president of the National Urban League. And I hope you don't mind. I gave them your name. I just kind of laughed and said, wow, that's pretty interesting. They're looking for a new CEO. And I said, they probably have a succession plan and, and they're going through the motions. He said, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. He says, anyway, uh, search the search guy's gonna call me. And uh, I got a call from the search guy. Now mind you, I've been at the law firm five months, six months, and uh, they had made a big deal over hiring me. And I was, you know, doing my thing, trying to build a book of business and, you know, trying to decompress from eight years and the mayor's office and probably almost 12 to 15 years in elected office. Uh, one thing led to another and I uh, uh, sent him my materials. I was doing this very quietly and I got a call, come to New York on a Monday, come Saturday, uh, we wanna interview you. Went up there, got interviewed by four or five people, spent about two hours and they said, okay, we'll be back in touch with you. And I didn't hear anything for three weeks. And then they called back on a Tuesday and said, come to New York on Saturday. Got to meet with the whole search firm. And I went, met with the search firm, which is a rather large search firm, about 18 people mm -hmm. uh, in a big conference room at a big lawyer's office in New York City. Uh, and I went through this interview. Mind you, I did zero politicking. I didn't know who was in the hunt. I didn't get anybody to call anybody. I didn't do anything, right? But send them my materials. I, and I sent them some video clips uh, of, of, of myself, I guess, in action. I had these video clips I had done. Uh, when I was president of the Conference of Mayors. And I went back to New Orleans on a Saturday evening and my wife said, they're gonna call you tomorrow and offer you the job, you know? And uh, I said, yeah, nobody's calling on a Sunday morning to offer a job to anybody. You're, you say you're dreaming. Lo and behold, the phone didn't ring at 8.30 in the morning, right? And it was the chair of the search firm on a Sunday morning. He said, well, you know, you're it. <laughs> Must have had a good interview. Yeah. So I thought this is, you know, just to make the story, I, I thought, okay, this is, uh, you know, late April, I figured I'd get a three month transition and get an opportunity to kind of organize my life. And uh, at the time we had a uh, one year old son and uh, my wife's a working journalist and we, uh, uh, they, they said, no, you're gonna come up here in about three weeks. We're gonna have a board meeting and uh, we'll vote you in. And they gave me not a lot of detail because they said, I said, well, you know, they said, yeah, we'll, we'll work out the contract, let the board vote, blah, 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 blah. I go to a meeting, they say, well, I said, when do I start? This is like May. I said, why don't I start after the 4th of July weekend? Give me, they said, no, 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 you have to go start right now. Like you have to go today. I'm like, go today, I have another job. I have things to do, I'm in the middle of a life. Anyway, came up here. And uh, my wife didn't come up for the first six, eight, 10 months. Mm. She stayed in New Orleans and, uh, and, and she came up once or twice to look for places to live and uh, found a wonderful place in Park Slope, Brooklyn. We figured let's rent for a couple of, a couple, maybe you know a year, 18 months, figure out what we wanna do. And we looked at apartments in Manhattan. So my mindset was I'm moving to New York and we live in Manhattan. When I saw those tiny apartments, you know, we had a nice big house in New Orleans. I'm like, what? No way, not for this kind of money. So we ended up in Brooklyn. And after being in Brooklyn for about 18 months, which we really loved the experience, uh, my wife said, uh, you know, we, we were looking around the buy, we looked in Brooklyn, we looked around, everything was just complete sticker shock. And I had some classmates and she had some friends in Maplewood, South Orange. Mm -hmm. Said, come on out here and look. My first reaction was I did not 
move to New York to move to New Jersey. Uh, like, what is this, New Jersey? What is this place? Uh, anyway, I had some classmates and, uh, and uh, she had some friends who lived out here. And they kind of reeled us in. We came out, we looked at some houses. And, you know, we have this interesting system in our family. Uh, you know, we both have one vote on big decisions, but it's like the electoral college. On some decisions, her vote counts for more. You know, I still haven't figured it out, but that's how it works. <laughs> anyway, we moved out uh, first to Maplewood. Now we live in South Orange. And it's been one of the best decisions we could have made because we have an 18 year old who's now a freshman at Penn. We have a, uh, a daughter who's a freshman in high school. And, and it's just been an incredible place for us to live. And it's given us, I realized the chance to work in the city and the hustle of the city and the, you know, and, and also to come out here and, and live a, a more, a more, you know, a more sane life, I would call it, you know, and a great place to raise our kids. They, they made just such incredible relationships and friends. And we made a lot of friends out here also. So I kind of came here happenstance. I came here not knowing what I was going to get into. I came here, you know, just, uh, you know, thinking that I was going to live in New York, but then learning about New York and say, wow, you know, you just have to live in a small space and pay a lot of money. And that's the way it is. And if you want that kind of lifestyle, I just didn't want it, right? I just said, I got a house. I like flowers. I like birds. You know, we like kind of, you know, uh, we had a house in the city, but New Orleans is a different kind of place than New York. You don't have, you have a place where you could live downtown if you want to live that, live kind of more of a pedestrian lifestyle. But most of the neighborhoods have houses and, and, and driveways. So we ended up here, but it's been a great, great decision. And we've loved the community. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's Mayberry in many respects. Uh, uh, and, uh, that's, and it, that's how we got here. It was very, Great very story. happenstance, but, but we, we've now been here. My wife and I were talking on Sunday, almost 16 years. And, and we're in our second house out here and we, we really enjoyed it. And, uh, it's given us, uh, you know, uh, something that we would not have expected when we moved here. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we moved to New York, we just had no idea we'd end, here, end up here. And we were reminiscing because the friend who, uh, who uh, sort of really reeled us out here. I mean, she was very, you need to come here, talk to this person. This is the real estate agent you want. Look here, look there, look everywhere. Uh, you know, passed about five years ago. And we were reminiscing this Sunday about her, about how wonderful. And, and, my, and, and we both said, yeah, with, without Heather, we wouldn't have been here. Mm -hmm. Just would not have been here. She just kind of rolled, reeled us in, you know, and with a person with a big personality, knew everybody, you need to know this one, Matt, need this one, that one, and the other one, this is great, that's great. So we love the community. Well, she did a good job and we're all thankful for it. Um, mm -hmm. When we were talking, it was interesting, you, you know, obviously Maplewood and New Orleans are, are pretty different, um, but but you, you think that there's some parallels in a way between New Orleans and Essex yeah. County, and in a yeah. sense, um, you know, that we should, we would be better off, um, you feel, if we thought of ourselves in a sense more, you know, uh, beyond our, our towns and, 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 and had more of an identity uh, for, for the county that Essex is. Yeah, you know, it's, it's uh, interesting. And we were talking about that because I look at when I first moved here, I never knew where I was. In other words, this is, am I still in Maplewood? No, this is Milburn. No, is this, no, you're in South Orange. No, you're in Irvington. You know, you're in, uh, you're now in Newark. I'm like, well, where, where, how do I know the difference? I had to figure out how to look at the street signs and different designs and stuff. I mean, you had to learn, like, this is like one kind of community that seems to be carved up into towns, which in a place like New Orleans would not be a town, but a neighborhood. Right, and New Orleans is a place of multi neighborhoods that are very different. They're almost villages and like villages and towns. Sometimes the houses look different, the architecture looks different, depending on the town you were in. And I and I and I remarked that you know New York went through a transformation in the 1800s, where the five boroughs consolidated into a single city, and Jersey tends to be the un-New York. Uh, you know, people don't think in living here that they're living in a big urban area, but fundamentally Essex County is like one big city. 
even though it has separate political jurisdictions. And sometimes that creates a mindset, a town mindset. You know, I live in this town. I don't live in this sort of bigger and broader community uh, that has uh, people like me and people not like me and uh, assets that I have or assets I don't have. Or, uh, and, and it's just an interesting dynamic how Jersey, North Jersey, is different than New York. And it's almost by deliberation and by design, I think, that uh, you get this sort of town atmosphere. But you're, you know, my friends who visit here, uh, they don't, they look at it and say, this is not really, doesn't feel like suburbs to me. It just feels like a, it's a nice neighborhood in the city, right? Uh, it just, it just seems like, uh, you know, if you go to Philadelphia, it looks like, uh, you know, Germantown or or one of these areas, uh, mainline Philadelphia, you know, it looks like, uh, you know, one of these nice neighborhoods. It doesn't really have the sense. And I just think that it, it's an observation of someone from, uh, who's not from here, but it's also an observation of someone that thinks about urban communities and cities and suburban communities and relationships and community and how to build bridges and what pulls people apart, what pulls people together. It's not really a criticism, it's more of an observation. And I remember when we were moving here, uh, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the lawyers who was working on the closing, we got into a long conversation, he was telling me about the character of the oranges, how historically they had different religious and ethnic characters. And I said, that is really fascinating. He says, he says yeah, he says, that's why it's not one community. He says they split themselves up. I said, hmm, that's, that's quite interesting. It was an interesting piece of history. I mean, that, that, that framing doesn't exist in the same way today, but it's an interesting commentary on, we'll call it what, early 20th century America, you know, in terms of how people thought about the communities they wanted to build and live in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're talking at a library event and something that always sticks in my mind is that Sarah, you know, has, has mentioned how how kids who don't have high-speed internet access um, need to, you know, even when the library is closed, sometimes sit in the parking lot and take AP tests. Um, what are your thoughts about the economic disparities, both in, you know, in in our community and, you know, and certainly in Essex County, and our obligation uh, to, to close them? So I think that as uh, 21st century Americans, as people who live uh, now in 2021. What we need to be mindful of is that economic disparities have widened on our watch, in our life, in this century. They've widened. And they've widened dramatically because of the significant increase in wealth at the top of the house, uh, so to speak. Uh, it's been dramatic. If you look at it, uh, compared to 1945 or 1965 or 1985, or even 2000, how wide these disparities have become. And I think it's not sustainable. Uh, I think it creates, and it's already created political friction in interesting ways, but it is a commentary on where, where we are. And I think we have an obligation to think about whether a nation like ours is so prosperous. Uh, you know, we're moving into a $20 trillion GDP. We're moving into a an economy that's three times as large as the economy in 1990. So how can you have an economy three times as large, but have uh, wider economic disparities? How can you have an economy? Is it a failure of public policy? Is it a commentary on capitalism? Uh, what, what might it be? But it is something that has got to be confronted and dealt with. It plays out you know, in our community. Uh, and, and it has a, a, a both an economic and a racial lens on it. Uh, and it can't be created, it can't be fixed by philanthropy or charity alone. It has to be fixed by empowerment and by enlightenment uh, uh, of people and of communities uh, to think about what the, what the issue is. And this is what I say too, what you have in America today is you have a rising level of people who are in poverty who work. This is what people have to get in their head. We're talking about unemployed people. We're talking about people at work. We're talking about uh, young uh, women with children, dominantly. 
That's who makes the minimum wage. That's who's trying to hold down two jobs. We're talking about something that that really strikes at the heart of what uh, uh, what we what we what we what we believe we are as a nation. You know that there's economic opportunity and prosperity. Everyone wants it, and everyone works. And that's just not the reality. And it's changed. We, you know, we had a Goldilocks economic period in this country from 1945 to maybe 1980, 85, where poverty decreased, uh, the standing of uh, every quintile of the American population, American society, kind of rose, and it it framed many people's thinking about how things were. And quite candidly, you have uh, decision makers uh, 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 who are stuck in that period, you know, some political, some business. And so the emergence of new and enlightened elected leaders, business leaders, and philanthropic leaders who understand today, the problems of today, the depth of challenges today. You talked about broadband, you know, uh, broadband's a necessity high-speed broadband's a necessity. I'm excited about the new library. I think it's a great, great thing. I mean, I think the chance to build something that is, you know, got more wires on it and more power and more, you know, Wi-Fi uh, ability and is built for kids and is a magnet for kids, surely come here uh, and connect and, 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 and do things. But the larger question, and this is an issue, uh, a plan the National Urban is gonna release, uh, we'll call the Latimer Plan, which talks about bringing high-speed broadband connectivity and also high-speed broadband affordability to every single house. Uh, imagine the fight 100 years ago, 100 to 150 years ago for indoor plumbing. Uh, imagine the fight for electrification. Imagine the battle to build paved roads when horses and horses and buggies went out of style and automobiles replaced it. And how those initiatives were carried out by the government and they were carried out by the government in partnership with the private sector and, the, and, and NGOs. We have a time, I just believe we have to think big. We have to be imagined, we have to be imaginative about today's problems or we're, 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 we're creating a greater divide whose foundation is gonna be an economic divide and then when you layer it in it, when you layer it, layer it into race, it challenges the whole fundamental notion of America as a land of opportunity and prosperity for all, which is why those of us who are successful, quote unquote, economically, have to think about it. You know, we're charged with thinking about it because people of the 20th century, in the early 20th century, in the mid 20th century, they thought about the future. They, they, they designed for the future. They're, they, 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 you know, what, 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 what of tomorrow was important to them. And that's why uh, many of the things we take for granted today exist. So part of your philosophy and, and um, you just published a book in the middle of the pandemic. I have it here, the Gumbo Coalition. Um, you were elected as that young mayor. Um, you, you credited a Gumbo Coalition and I'd love you to explain what that means and also, you know, is that a philosophy, you know, that it's not your job or my job, but everybody's job that, that has continued to this day? Thank you for asking and appreciate you uh, lifting up the book. And the <laughs> book is a leadership book of, you know, lessons I learned. And, and part, of the, part of the philosophy, my philosophy of governing uh, was to try to build large coalitions that provided big wins which required you to think big. We had to have a big housing initiative. We had to have a big infrastructure initiative. We had to have a big public safety initiative. I had to force people to think beyond traditional ways. Uh, the idea being that within a larger frame and a bigger vision, there was just much more room for more people to participate and be a part of it. You know, at the municipal level, uh, leading a city, you tend to not have the kind of hard ideological lines that you have at the national level. You have more you know, bread and butter issues. You have more issues of opportunity and distribution of resources. You know, you have some, uh, you know, some, you have, you, have, you have racial divisions. And the idea of the Gumbo Coalition is that New Orleans is an incredibly, you know, uh, wonderful and, and very varied city. 
uh, blacks, whites, Latinos, Asians. Uh, we had, uh, you know, every single community. I mean, it's a, it's a mini New York in many ways uh, in terms of the number of people. And I, I was seeking, you know, the concept of the gumbo to try to create a frame for what we were trying to do, uh, which was to bring, you know, bring people together and, and not bring people together for the sake of bringing them together, bring them together on ideas and initiatives uh, and participating in the design of big initiatives. Let's think big about housing. Let's think big about infrastructure. Let's think big about public safety. Uh, let's, uh, let's sometimes, let's just agree on what we can agree on. And we'll fight about these other things next week because we don't agree on everything, right? So part of it was uh, trying to force. And when you're the chief executive, you have the power, you can set the tone, you can bring people to the table, you can create, uh, you know, and so it was really an effort and I felt to get the city beyond some of its factionalism and, uh, and also get it to, to some extent to confront its racial dynamics and its racial legacy, but by creating uh, initiatives where city government was going to invest in neighborhoods that had been locked out and forgotten about, but how were we going to do it? Uh, I was going to do it because we were going to think bigger. We were going to expand the convention center and build an arena and build new parks and playgrounds. Uh, you know, we were going to uh, uh, repair the airport and we were going to repair all the pools. Not right? or. Huh? Not or. And. Not or. And it required bigger thinking and it required more resources and it required more money. And, and, and I remember telling the business leaders one time, look, this is about whether you believe in a, in a static pie or a growing pie. You got to decide. If you think in a static pie, then everything you don't get, somebody else gets. Or everything they get is taken from you. Think of a growing pie. You know, we can all win. And so it, it kind of, you know, it was a swing of the 1990s. You had a better economy. We had the Clinton administration in office, which generally was pro-cities. Uh, you know, he made mistakes in, in the criminal justice arena, no doubt. But in terms of investments in housing, you know, economic empowerment, welfare to work programs, you know, we had resources to work with, some youth employment programs, we had some resources uh, to be able to work with. And I think that for communities now, you know, you got to work and try uh, to, uh, to build across lines. You got to work and dialogue, but you have to, in today's, it's so important that equity and opportunity be guiding principles. You can't do this superficially. You have to confront the deep problems. And I'm struck. I left office in 2002. And I remember uh, in 2000 thinking uh, the American economy in the year 2000 may have been, you know, in, in, in the best shape it had been in the previous 30 years, low, low joblessness, low inflation. I mean, people were, make, were obsessing about Y2K. That's about the only thing people could obsess about. You know, they were like, why too? Oh my goodness, why my elevator's gonna stop working, my stop watch is gonna go off, my 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 oven will stop with anything that's connected to any form of even primitive technology will discontinue working. And then now we've had this 20-year period of 9-11 and Hurricane Katrina and the tsunami and the Great Recession and the bank crisis. And you know, the pol the politics has swung from having the first African American president to having Trump. Right. That's how far the politics, the polit there's been no wider swing, you know, in a, in a short period of time in American politics and what we witnessed. And it, it, it is an indicative of the tension between hope and, and, and aspirations for the future and sort of a retrenchment and fear of tomorrow and what America might be uh, tomorrow. And, and I think that responsible leaders, uh, 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 people of goodwill, uh, conscious people, you can't fight tomorrow. You got to define it. You got to shape it. You got to. You got. You got. You, you got to. You got to. You got to create the hope and the aspiration and the reality for tomorrow. You can't fight tomorrow. You can't think that you can just somehow get in the time machine and go backwards. Could we just talk for a moment about race directly? Um, yep. Did you, you know? Obviously, you know this is a, a a moment of you know increasing awareness of of just how how much work there is to do, um, uh, and and equity feels so far off, um, especially in the wake of the George Floyd murder and so many so many similar incidents. 
did you think we would be further along? Like how, you know, as, as mayor, you, or there's, no you? there's no question. There's no question. I, I deep, really believe that we'll be, we would be further along. And I'll, I'll tell you guys a personal story because important to understand. I, when I grew up, uh, I integrated the elementary, middle and high school that I attended. The middle school I attended, I was the only black person with two black students in the whole school, I was the only black person in my class for four years. Uh, in high school, there were 14 African-American students out of a thousand, you know, at the school. Uh, it, it was at times very tough, you know, uh, being called the N-word, uh, having to stand up for yourself was not, uh, you know, you became conditioned to believe that that's what you had to do. The idea that that's repeating itself in such a raw way is disappointing. It's disenchanting. I would have thought we, would have, we could have and we would have made uh, much more progress, but what we what what we what we missed, and I think that this is true, uh, is that in order to confront race, you have to be explicit. You know, you can't take the approach that the less you talk about it, the more it'll go away. Uh, you can't take the approach of pretending that it's not a factor uh, when it lives within in uh, subconscious and both implicit and explicit ways. You can't pretend that it hasn't affected the reality of the way uh, black people live in America today uh, or the stereotypes assigned to black people in America today. You, you just can no longer pretend. And I think the, the George Floyd moment and the George Floyd you know, murder on the streets of Minneapolis uh, was, was a profound wake up call for the nation. Let me tell you what it prompted in my own personal life. And I think this is important and I've shared this before. Uh, I got a letter uh, about, I guess, six weeks after George Floyd, uh, uh, the George Floyd incident took place. And it was from a person I'd gone to middle school with many, many years ago. You know, this is uh, 45 plus years ago. And uh, it was an apology letter mm -hmm. from someone that said, you know, I was, and this is from a, a, a I was a, a boy who was older than me who said he apologized for racially bullying me when we were in middle school and then went into a little bit of a descriptor about how the George Floyd moment had forced him to reconsider the kind of person he was or how he thought about things. Now, this was a completely unprovoked, unsolicited letter, you know, that I received from a person uh, at the time, and I had to, I had to really do a hard recall to really recollect because there was so many little, they call them microaggressions now in those days, but you know, those days, you know, if somebody called your name, you pushed on them, you fought them, you know, you defended your honor, right? That's the way I, I sort of grew up. And, uh, you know, the, the, but, but it, 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 it's a profound moment. I asked myself, how many other people had, uh, how many other white Americans had, 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 had a moment of conscience? conscious awakening uh, to say, let me introspectively look at things a bit differently. And that's an important element of this because we cannot, we cannot uh, 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 change this. Uh, Black Americans can't change this, right? Uh, Black Americans can, can continue to be a force for equity and for change. Uh, but but the framing and the impact is so broad. And now I think we have to confront that you have a growing Latinx population. Uh, we've seen this just awful uh, attack on Asian Americans in the last six weeks to eight weeks. I mean, just horrific, right? And then we live in a time when hate crimes against Blacks, Jews, Muslims, Asian Americans, LGBTQ have increased in these times. This is 2021, this is not 1960, right? And we have to, this is a, a moment of great recognition for us when it comes to race. And, you know, my thought, you know, my thought process is, you know, can we build this multi, you know, what, what really, 
it really is, can we really build, and I think we can, because I'm optimistic, a multicultural democracy with economic opportunity that works for everyone. You know, can we, can, and can we embrace it? And can we work towards it and be very, very serious about it as, you know, as, as a defining, you know, finding value or theme in 21st century America. And I think that's where we are. That's very well said. We have a number of questions coming in. I just, mm -hmm. before we go to questions, have to ask you, you told me a story that I can't stop thinking about, about your library story. And most people do have a library story. And your story was um, when you are, I believe in first grade, um, a little later than that. A little later, okay. Yeah, but I'll tell you. Had to, you had to memorize a speech yeah. by Martin Luther King and you did not have a copy of it. Um, could yeah. you please fill in it's the blanks? Great, yeah. So <laughs> I was in, it, it happened at, at my middle school, right? There was a speech night and you had an opportunity to participate in competitive speech contests. And the speech contest, you had to dress up and put a suit on and go to the school at night and it'd be a whole classroom full of parents and you know, graders, it was a big deal. And you could either pick prose or poetry or humor or serious. And so it was a very, you know, big deal. And uh, I decided to do prose and I decided, this was probably 71, 72, that I was gonna do Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. And uh, then I had a little newspaper article that I'd cut out that had the final words of the speech. But I didn't have the whole speech, right? How do I find the whole speech? My mother was a second grade teacher. And uh, we grew up in a neighborhood where there was no public library nearby. But there was the library of Southern University at New Orleans, which was the school built in 1960 when they were trying to maintain segregation. They built LSU at New Orleans, and then about a mile away, they built Southern University at New Orleans because they're trying to say, we built LSU, we got to build Southern in New Orleans. Anyway, my mother said, you go down there and you go to the library at Southern University. I never been in this library. I knew where it was because we used to play, you know, play basketball down at, in the gym down there and ask the librarian for, you know, to help you find a speech. And I went down there and, you know, I'm, 12, 13 years old, the library looked at me. He says, you, that's the speech you want? He said, what are you gonna do with it? I said, sir, I have to memorize it and, and give, a, uh, give a speech and, and a speech contest. He said, you just sit over there. I'm, I'm gonna find it. I know it's around here somewhere. So I found the speech. The next year I did uh, the same, I did Dr. King's final speech. I have a I've been to the mountaintop and went back and got the speech from him again. So it was, it was, it was fascinating. And librarian, you know, what made a library was the helpfulness of a library, you know, because you're that age and you don't really know how to do the research in the library. You don't really know the Dewey Decimal System or the card catalog when you're at that age. I mean, maybe they, they taught it to you, but and the library helped me find the speech and and I got the speech and I remember I. Uh, stable it on these ca cardboard and 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 memorize it the best I could and I won first place in the contest you know the good news about these speeches is that you know if I skipped the whole paragraph no one would know <laughs> as long as with that speech you got the beginning right and you got the end right uh, but it was a, it was a great moment and my mother was a you know a driver and her sister was a librarian, a high school librarian, public high school librarian. So, you know, we were in a, in a house where we were always given books and, you know, and, and, and that sort of thing. So that's my library moment. It wasn't the public library because there was, but it was a library. As far as we were concerned, the library at the college was our library, it's our neighborhood library. That's a great story about the importance of libraries. Sarah, would you like to, uh, to get into questions? Absolutely, and thank you so much. I mean, this has been such an inspiring conversation. Um, 
So first, I want to just mention that we have, um, you know, we uh, we have a fair amount of elected officials in our attendees, um, and Mayor Frank McGee is with us, um, uh, Township Committee uh, Vic DeLuca, Township Committeeman uh, Dean Daffis, and Committeewoman uh, Nancy Adams. We also have members of our Board of Trustees, Kate McCaffrey and Robert Marchman and others, um, and foundation members, um, including Ben Cohen and Rebecca Rickers. So I do wanna acknowledge, um, you know, we've, we've got an incredible community and I just wanna thank everyone. And for thank them for coming out. Thank you for their service. Um, and, and Mayor uh, McGee uh, said, I wanna thank my friend and frat brother, Mark Morial for his continued support of our Maplewood community and his leadership for advocating for economic and social justice for people of color in our country. You are a pillar for equity for all, Mayor Thanks. Frank McGee. Um, so I thought I'd start with a question um, by Township Committeeman um, uh, DeLuca. Thank you for challenging us to think big. Given the split in the United States Senate and the need to move Biden's big agenda and critical social and voting rights legislation, should the filibuster be eliminated and how much effort should be put into bipartisan support? So, you know, it's interesting. Uh, 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 we were in a long discussion about this, two discussions today about the filibuster. And, and I believe that the filibuster has been abused. Uh, and because it's been abused, it's time to find a way to create exceptions to it, uh, the, uh, to make it far more difficult to use. Uh, it's become a standing filibuster. But here's the important thing for people to realize. It's not part of the Constitution. It didn't come from the founding fathers. It was a Senate rule. It started in the early 1800s. But its most vigorous usage has been on issues of race in the reconstruction period and then in the 1960s. And even against the backdrop of that, uh, its usage today has become so commonplace that it thwarts the will of democracy. Uh, and I believe that uh, there's, there's got to be, I'll call it filibuster reform. Uh, uh, like reconciliation is an exception to the filibuster. There need to be more exceptions to the filibuster. Consider this, Harry Reid as majority leader said, we'll get rid of it for the confirmation of, uh, of, uh, of cabinet officers because he was, Obama was facing a thwarting of his ability to fill his cabinet. Then Mitch McConnell says, we'll get rid of it for Supreme Court justices. Did the world come to an end? Maybe we, uh, we, uh, we wish, uh, uh, I may wish that it may have been there for Supreme Court justices. But the point of the matter is, is that exceptions have been created and it just raises questions as to whether it's archaic. This notion of bipartisanship is a romanticized thought process that lives in the political circles within the Beltway, and I'll tell you why. We just witnessed uh, Joe Biden with the American Rescue Plan. Here's the most important thing about the American Rescue Plan. This thing's polling at 70 plus percent, which means there's a bipartisan consensus among the people. Liberals, conservatives, and moderates, Northeast, South, and West, Black, White, Hispanic, Asian, old and young, this thing's polling a majority of almost every demographic group, yet no bipartisan vote in the Congress on the bill. What does that say about our politics, that our politicians are out of step with their own constituents, that they do not follow nor fear the will of the American people? And I think when you consider that as a factor, uh, you know, it raises significant questions about whether uh, the filibuster is a useful tool or whether it is a thwart on democracy. Here's what I believe. Mary Jones, who lives in downtown Irvington, uh, Sally Jones, who lives in Morris County, who vote all the time, but are not the most political people, they could give a care about the filibuster. It's not the Bill of Rights. It's not Article 1, 2, or 3 of the Constitution. Would it be better if our 
leaders would cut deals and get together? Yes. We're in a state of emergency. We're in a crisis. 11 million people unemployed. We have a racial justice crisis. We have a pandemic now of voter suppression in places like Georgia that are emerging from, 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 from the aftermath of the, 19, uh, the 2020 election. And, and, and we're gonna fiddle and fiddle over an archaic Senate rule as opposed to having up or down votes on significant pieces of legislation. I mean, you know, I have a title, a paragraph in my book, uh, or a chapter in my book, it's a wise person changes, a fool never. And I think it's time to think about reforming it. You may not have to get rid of it, you may have to reform it so that it is not the kind of tool uh, that, uh, that, uh, that it is. Uh, uh, and it never look. Last thing I'll say is the Senate itself is already built to create as much power in two United States senators from Wyoming or Delaware with less than a million people. Having the same power on par with the two US senators from New York State, 20 million people. California, almost 40 million people. So the Senate is already balanced by structure to give, quote, minority the same power as a large state. You don't, the, fil the filibuster is a superfluous, uh, if you will, tool that uh, I think, uh, in my own point of view, I just think I'm going to start calling it the Jim Crow filibuster. Because that's what it's used, it's been used for most, most, most ardently. Okay, um, since this talk is headlined as addressing injustice and inequity in our community, where specifically do you think we can do better? What specifically are the barriers to equity and justice that you see in Maplewood? I think, uh, and, 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 and this is important, uh, issues in Maplewood and South Orange with policing require continuing attention monitoring because it's the touchstone uh, of, uh, of uh, the system of systemic racism. And, and, and I'm saying this without knowing what the current status of things are, but I really think that great attention and transparency needs to be paid to uh, the operations, the activities of the police department. And I also think that a, a good police department always has a, an independent mechanism for people to bring complaints. So they don't have to complain to the department. They complain to a separate ombudsman, a civilian complaint review, but whatever it is, that they don't have to go to the department to complain about the department. That they have a separate place and they know that their identity is gonna be protected, the character of the complaint is gonna be uh, protected, and it's gonna be, it's gonna be looked at expeditiously and carefully. That's the hallmark of due process when it comes uh, indeed to policing. Now, secondly, most importantly in this, in, this, in this region, and this is an Essex County issue, Essex County has got uh, the most poverty and the most prosperity. And the region of Essex plus Morris plus uh, the Northern Jersey, has probably as much wealth as any region in the country, side by side with as much poverty. And, and I, I really believe that if there's an area of continuing attention, it's around economic opportunity, it's around, it's around poverty, uh, it's around uh, confronting those types of challenges uh, in, in this community, because it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is where the, it's where the racial, issues uh, 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 meet uh, where, where it hits the road, right? Right there, because it gets into how people live, what their, what their quality of life is, what their opportunities are. These are not easy issues to confront, but they require continuing attention and, and a commitment. And I think in, this, in these communities, uh, I think, uh, uh, that is uh, so so overriding and so important. Uh, we uh, 
you know, it, it, and, and I'll say this, every community in America, every city, every metro area in America is a tale of two cities. I don't care if you go to Omaha or Cleveland or Pittsburgh or Philadelphia or Baton Rouge or Little Rock. That's what we've created in this country. You know, tales of two cities, abundant. And it is to me the Achilles tendon of the future of the country. Well, I think that's a good segue to the next question is, um, what role is the Urban League pl playing to address this economic and racial gap in New Jersey so, and in other areas, I guess? So we, uh, in New Jersey, uh, we have uh, several affiliates, most, most significantly the Urban League of Essex County, which operates primarily in Newark, mm -hmm. the Urban League of Hudson County, which operates in Jersey City, uh, and the Urban League of Union County, which operates in uh, Elizabeth. Uh, we have a small affiliate, uh, not, uh, not what they used to be in Morris and Bergen. Uh, for example, uh, we, we operate uh, uh, where there is local interest and energy and resources uh, because we're a bottoms up organization versus a top down organization. So what we do is important. So we operate really on three fronts. We're a direct services provider. So in any given year, we provide a million and a half to 2 million people with direct services, after school, workforce development, job training and job placement services, home buyer education and uh, financial literacy services, uh, 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 small businesses, 14,000 a year uh, through, a system, through a set of centers. So we're a direct services provider. Then we're a public policy advocate. Uh, the national, we work on the Washington national front. So I've got a team of about 12 to 15 people in DC who work on public policy. We work very hard on the American Rescue Plan. Uh, some of the provisions in there we'd like to take a little credit for. Uh, the uh, the uh, Home Buyer Rescue Fund of, of, of $25 billion, $100 million for housing counseling. Uh, we fought for the minimum wage. We, we didn't get the minimum wage. We fought so that cities and states would have money, including money for community-based vaccination sites uh, in COVID. We fought for changes to the uh, uh, Paycheck Protection Program to make smaller businesses and minority businesses more available. So we're very involved in, 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 in on, the, on the policy front, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, uh, bills like HR1, uh, we, we're, gonna, we're gonna try to put a stake in the ground on the infrastructure conversation. Uh, we're gonna be fighting to make sure it includes broadband dollars and uh, we want dollars for water systems uh, we'd like to see dollars in the infrastructure bill for parks and playgrounds and libraries and community centers, uh, not just big highways. You know, we don't need to just pave highways. We need to build communities. And so we're going to be pushing and, and, and fighting. And we've been working for that on, on, on those types of elements because Congress has been talking infrastructure for a long, long time. And we want it to be more than transportation. So we work our affiliates work on local issues of local public policy. Uh, you know, and we're not, uh, every affiliate in the movement is not exactly the same. Uh, you know, we have uh, uh, 90 affiliates across the nation. Some of the stronger affiliates are in places like Chicago, Columbus, Ohio, Cleveland, New Orleans, Atlanta, Houston, Philadelphia. Uh, Newark is, uh, in the Urban League of Essex County, is one of our stronger affiliates. Uh, Hudson County, for the things they do in a small, a smaller community, uh, they uh, I like I like to say they punch above their weight uh, in those communities. Uh, could we have a bigger footprint in New Jersey? Yes, we could. Uh, it requires local community leaders to say that an urban league affiliate is a vehicle that would help our community, and we will build it. Uh, and you can help us build it, and we help them build it. So we're about to embark on a, you know, a very big infrastructure project in Maplewood with our new library. Um, so how do we create a library that gives everyone a sense of belonging? And how can the library become a physical, cultural, and emotional front porch to the community? 
So I, I think it's such an exciting opportunity, Sarah, to build in the library. I mean, it's, it's just so, I mean, obviously, you know, you've got to think technology, technology, technology. But what about arts and culture? What about thinking of the, uh, the library as a place where the visual arts can be practiced and celebrated? Uh, what about a library where uh, the musical arts could be practiced and celebrated? That the library is a library, but it's a, it's a broader 21st century community center. And, and I think trying to think about the multiple constituencies, you gotta think about little kids and medium kids and bigger kids and big old, big old, big old, big old, old kids like us, right? Who wanna, who wanna, uh, I just think it's an exciting opportunity. How you can pack all of that in under one, uh, you know, one roof or one system or on one campus, if you will, I think is really, really uh, the challenge. I mean, look, people, libraries are also today quasi business centers. You know, people go to use the computer. Uh, I, I just think you have to let your imagination run wild without your budget running wild. <laughs> and I just think there's so much. When I was mayor in New Orleans, I pushed the libraries to put computers. This is in the late 1990s. And they're like, why are we putting computers in here? I said, just put them in there so people who don't have computers can come get on the internet. This was in the early days of the internet. And, and I went out and begged computers from you know, all these upstart dot coms would come around and I just beg and made the library create these tech centers, you know, inside the libraries. Uh, and and the old the old fashioned librarians were very resistant. Mm -hmm. You know, they were so like, you know, we're, we're not about we're about books. What is this? I said, these these computers, I don't know where they're going. I said, but 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 they put this thing in there and that tech center was packed all the time. And the interesting thing is that it was packed with visitors from out of town and residents. The downtown library became a very popular place for people from out of town, right? This is before people carried laptops around and before they had smartphones uh, to use. So I, I think you have to think, you know, you probably have already done this, but think broadly about the various uses while retaining the fundamental integrity of a place for knowledge, learning, and books. But it's got to be more than, it's got to be everything the library of yesterday was and everything a library of tomorrow needs to be. That's wonderful. So that, that's a great segue to our last, our final question. We have, a, you know, we have wonderful questions and unfortunately we're running out of time. Um, so we have um, one final question, and then we will go to former mayor, um, Ellen Davenport, who's also the treasurer of the foundation. Um, but this question is from uh, Principal Frank Sanchez, who's our principal at Columbia High School. And, um, and his question really is, um, he talks about like, you know, what he asks, um, how did you empower young people in New Orleans? And how do you see our students being engaged in issues today, specifically with equity? So when I was mayor, the city had no control over the schools. But what I did was I built a comprehensive program for young people. So first thing we did is for older teenagers, we created, I think at its apex, 3,500 to 4,000 summer jobs. Uh, and we cobbled together dollars from every federal source general fund source and private source. And we had a comprehensive program uh, uh, for summer jobs for teens where you, the teens had to go through an orientation program at the beginning of the program. Uh, and at the end of the program, we had a big awards ceremony and we, 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 we placed the kids in law firms, in government agencies, in nonprofit organizations because we wanted the young people to have a career experience. Uh, that was a big, big, big part of what I did and what I believed in. Uh, the second thing we did is we created a series of, uh, of free summer camps for kids ages like I think six to 14. And it was, they were free to any resident of the city. We didn't income 
if you live in a city and you want your kid to go to camp, kid go to camp. And I got in a, I got in a fight with my own people who wanted to put an admission fee on the thing at $15 and $25 and $30. And I really resisted it because I said, you know, a, a parent who wants to send their kid to a pay camp, they'll do it. This is for people who, for whatever the reason, and our camps were interesting. We created outdoor camps, art camps, sport camps. Uh, we re, re completely reformed the city's recreation department. In those days, the all too many of the, the sports were too skewed toward boys. There wasn't enough stuff for girls. We had a women's athletic director and created a whole series. So I took the, the, the functionalities of the city, which were youth development and youth services and the recreation department and literally just blew, blew life into them, blew life into them, blew resources into them and, and blew creativity into them. Let's do arts, you wanna do arts, you wanna do culture camp, you wanna do music camp. You want to do outdoor camp. Uh, let's do it all, right? Let's give everybody a chance. You know, every camp doesn't need to be alike. Uh, and, and so the theory was, my theory was keep young people busy. Let me keep young people busy. The beauty of it was when we got it going after one or two, then it became contagious. Every church, every private school, everybody's trying to create a summer camp, right? And I, I got all the, I, I called all the city contractors together, had a big old meeting one time. I said, I want each of you guys to do one thing. Hire one kid this summer. Hire one kid off our list, out of our program. All, just one. Some of you could hire 20, just hire one. Give them a meaningful experience. And so I saw my job as being an advocate, but I also my job as trying to expand, you know, the opportunities for young people. And I think that, uh, a school, an anchoring school like Columbia, uh, working, you know, there's a lot of activities uh, in, in, in these towns. My, my children, my son played in the baseball program, he played the basketball program. And, and I always would say to my wife, I said, every time I said, I'm writing these checks, I'm writing these checks. I said, I don't mind writing these checks, but I always think about the parents that couldn't write the checks. And I always say, I wonder what happens to the parents who just can't write checks because in New Orleans, our rec program in those days was free. Regardless of income, you know, they'd have little fundraisers and booster club events. But if your kid wanted to play and your kid showed up, your kid could play. Whether he was from a rich family or a poor family, you know, it, it really didn't matter. And, and, and I fought to keep them free, right? Uh, even though... You know, there was a lot of pressure to add fees. I'll just say that this is a place where, you know, the, the goal should be, you know, an activity for every child, a summer activity for every child, a job opportunity for the young, a camp opportunity, uh, a, a job opportunity for the older kids, a camp opportunity for others, and to identify those young people in the community whose parents can't they don't have the connection to hook them up with a summer job, or they don't have the money to pay uh, for a summer camp opportunity and identify them and make sure they have an opportunity and truly leave no child out uh, from the age of, you know, six to 18, you know, in, 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 in the summer, right, in the summer, uh, and create those opportunities for them. And I think that for a community like this to set, set forth set that as a goal uh, would, be, would be a remarkable thing. You don't know, you know, those of us that can afford, we just pay, we pick up the phone, we get our, our kids, uh, you know, positioned someplace. And then we, we kind of take that for granted. You know, we kind of take it for granted. And we don't realize that they're just parents that don't have, but we have it. And, and then they, don't, they may not say anything. You know, they just may not say anything. And uh, so those are just some thoughts. Well, thank you so much, um, Mark Morial and Rebecca Blumenstein. This has been an incredible Thanks, Rebecca. evening. And I'm gonna turn this over to Ellen Davenport of the Maplewood Memorial Library Foundation. Thank you, Sarah. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ellen Davenport, as Sarah said. I'm treasurer of the Maplewood Memorial Library Foundation. 
On behalf of the foundation, Mark, I would like to thank you for participating in tonight's event. You've brought so much insight and leadership to this most important topic. We are grateful that we have you in our world. And Becky Blumenstein, thank you once again for leading this conversation in a clear and probing manner. You have performed a great service for this community by articulating every facet of this conversation. And, and to our audience this evening, we thank you for attending. We believe that our library is the heartbeat of this community. It is not just a place to borrow books, it is so much more. It's a gathering place to exchange ideas, a forum to debate issues, a book club to discuss the latest book, children's story hour, and yes, an opportunity to grow and expand our mutual horizons. For these reasons, the Township of Maplewood, the Library Board of Trustees, the Friends of the Library, and the Foundation have spearheaded a plan to rebuild this library. Our goal is now at hand. With financial leadership from the town, a state grant, and the donations of a very generous community, we are planning to break ground hopefully before the end of the year. We will have a beautiful structure. It will be environmentally smart. It will be a well laid out building that is accessible and welcoming to all. You will be very proud of it. Please visit our website and see the exciting plans. Also, please consider joining us and supporting this major endeavor. And in closing, I thank the Foundation's Events Committee, Becky Ritgers, Eva Bacon, Ariel Cohen, and Diane Haas for facilitating tonight's event. We wish you all good health. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Becky. Thank you. That was terrific. Thank Thanks you so both. Much. Good. Appreciate it. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Peter Paul, anybody? Yes, sir. Anybody got to talk to?